Okay, we can start. Um, hello and welcome everyone to our third series of Space Talk sponsored by the Saudi Space Commission. Uh, today's topic is women in space from empowerment to innovation. Today we are hosting a great woman leader in space. She is the co-initiator of SES Astra and the architect of SES Global. Uh, also, she has been devoted her life to starting and building new space ventures, privately financed and commercial uh, satellite television and telecommunication network, satellites mobile network, satellite internet network, and, uh, and also she had launched ventures related to space situational awareness, earth observation and intelligence. Uh, she also had high throughput satellites internet uh, Endeavor and micro satellite launchers, as well as promoting and creating new space investment funds. She is also a co founder uh, or co founded Oceania Women's Network Satellites. Um, she, uh, she is also the president of IBAN, the European Business Angel and Early Stage Investment Network, and also MENA Business Angels Network. Uh, among honor or among many honors, uh, she has been decorated as commander of the Luxembourg Order of Merits. Uh, she is also known for her work uh, in deregulating or deregulation, innovation, privatization, and globalization of, sp of many space projects. I'd like to welcome today uh, our uh, great guest, Dr. Candace uh, Eban or Candace Johnson. Welcome and greetings, doctor. Oh, so Dr. Amru, it's so nice to be with you and thank you so much for this invitation. You know, I have been uh, associated with uh, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia for almost 10 years now. And it was my great pleasure to uh, come and to work with um, His Highness Dr. Turkey, Prince Dr. Turkey, uh, with CAST. Uh, so the King Abdulaziz City for Science and Technology. I was on the International Advisory Board for many years. Um, I have, um, I, I was very happy to also work with Badir and, um, and just to, you know, to really meet all of the wonderful uh, women and men entrepreneurs in, in Saudi Arabia. And, you know, Saudi Arabia has a wonderful history and legacy of um, of space and you know being one of the first kingdoms and and countries in the Middle East to go into space um, not only with your astronauts but with your own built satellites and and so it's a great pleasure to to really be with you here today and Dr. Amber thank you thank you so much so but today you know we are going to talk about the women. And um, I, I would, I'm going to share a, a little um, um, uh, PowerPoint that um, I have. Uh, can is, can you see it or is yes, it? It's clear. Yes. It's good. Good. Okay. But does it? it, it okay. Uh, let me just see if I can. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. So um, so so you know, indeed, uh, I was asked by Dr. Amru if I could uh, talk about women uh, in space and particularly from empowerment to innovation. I would also just like to say that I was recently in San Francisco. I was speaking with the Fortune editor. I'm very happy to say that in maybe October, November, there will be a um, an article about women in space um, in Fortune. So I'm, I'm, you know, I'm always pushing the the woman, uh, the woman, um, um, uh, you know, uh, story. So, so this is really my story about how I um, got from being the only woman in this picture. This is uh, December 13th, 1988. And um, uh, we are launching, we are in Kourou in French Guiana, and we are launching the first ever transborder private satellite, uh, my satellite, SES, Société Européenne des Satellites Astra, and the very good looking gentleman uh, two over to the left behind me in the white shirt is the Grand Duke of Luxembourg and behind him is the Prime Minister of Luxembourg. But ladies, you will notice, unfortunately, I am the only woman. However, that was in 1988 and this is uh, in 2000, 
um, let me see, so eight years ago, um, 2012, 2013, when indeed uh, I started the Oceania Women's Network Satellite. So how did I get from there to you know being the only woman to having only women launch a satellite? It's fun. So you know, at the moment, the world has never needed so much connectivity, interactivity, interconnectivity, and instant infrastructure. So people ask me why I like space. And you know, I like space because it provides immediate infrastructure. You have a problem, put up a satellite, and you can correct that problem. And this, whether it be for television, for telecommunications, for internet, for mobile, um, for earth observation. Um, and of course, this is also bringing us to a couple of challenges, um, but we will, we will fix those as well, also with satellites. So, you know, 1957, um, so, you know, 64 years ago, uh, this is what, you know, the, we started with the Sputnik. And when I was five years old, also in 1957, you'll see that little kind of um, flying saucer. Well, I received it when I was five. And, um, uh, and Santa Claus was inside of it. My father was very big in telecommunications. He did the first satellites for the United States. He did the first satellite, private satellites. But at this time he was doing, he was at NATO in shape, Supreme Headquarters Allied Powers Europe in Europe, in Paris. And he gave me that little flying saucer same year that the Sputnik was launched. And from then on, it has always inspired me. And I always thought that good things come from satellites. And, you know, later on, we're going to talk a little bit about if you can be not a space engineer, and if you can do something in space. Well, you know what? I have five degrees in music and musicology. It is true that I grew up in a family who was really pioneering space, but my degrees are all in music. And so in 1974 uh, and 1976, when I finished all of my degrees, I started um, um, a, a con classical music uh, series. And um, I also became the executive producer of the United States largest classical music radio station. So here I was, I was doing all of these programs, everybody loved them. And I thought, this is ridiculous. I'm doing it for Washington DC, but I could be putting it all over the United States. And so that is what I did. I called up my dad. He was doing now his second satellite system, which was the first privately financed domestic satellite system in 1970. 1970, it was called Westar from Western Union. And I said, look, I need to have some satellite capacity. I want to put my radio station all over the United States. It was the first super station in the United States, and it was before Ted Turner. So women, you know, here again, we had a couple of firsts. And then, um, you know, I married my husband. So my husband was really very cute and very nice. And he was the ambassador of Luxembourg to the United States. And in 19, I married him in 1981. And in 1982, Luxembourg had three huge problems. They had a problem with their broadcasting stations. They had a problem with their uh, steel companies. And they had a problem with their monetary union with the Belgian franc. So they were looking for something new and young men and, and, and women, you know, so, so talk about innovation, talk about having an opportunity. Here, this little country in Luxembourg, you know, in Europe, you can see it, it's, you know, it is the littlest country there <laughs> between France, Germany, and Belgium. And, you know, they were looking for something. So I told the prime minister, and this is something, whenever you have an idea, just go to the person who has the authority to say yes. And so I went to the prime minister and I said, look, you could do a satellite system. And of course, for me, the only thing to do was a private satellite system. 
So that is what I did. In, in June 2nd, I wrote to the Prime Minister of 1982. And in February 1983, he called me. Now, I know that most of you weren't even born then, but okay, that's, that's the way it is. So, but in 1983, when I did this zone to cover all of Europe, Europe did not look like that. It had a line in the middle of it. And yet I didn't let it because the beautiful thing about satellites is that they, they see no barriers. And just like you, when you are doing things, always think barrierless, no barriers. 1983, this is the way I designed the Astra satellite. So then, now we come to my wonderful picture here. Five years later, now, when you think about it, five years was not a long time from 1983 to 1988, considering that it was not allowed to have a, a, a satellite system at all, much less a private satellite system. There were government monopolies um, who were doing telecommunications. There were government television stations who were also monopolies and privately reg and regulated by the government. And there was no venture capital. But I didn't know about that. I just knew that we wanted to use satellites to cover all of Europe and to give freedom of choice to all of the citizens in Europe. And so five years later, there we are in Karoo, in uh, French Guiana, and we are launching my satellite, privately financed, um, commercially oriented. We had, when we started, we had no uh, government stations. They didn't want us. They hated us because we were going against the status quo. But all of the new players, all of the people who wanted to go on satellite and were not allowed to, they all loved us. And so there we were, 1988, December 13th. Now, I'm just going to go back to the, um, the picture because you have to think ahead when you're doing things. You have to see the market. You have to have a vision. So what happened 11 months after we launched the first Astra satellite, Société Européenne des Satellites? Okay, the wall fell down. The Berlin Wall fell down on November 9th, 1989. And all of the people who had laughed at us and who had said, you cannot cover all of Europe, but we did. All of you those basically people, predicted that, huh? Ab absolutely. Yes. And I, I, it wasn't that I predicted it, Dr. Amru. It was that I wanted it to happen, that I believed in the freedom of choice. I did not believe in boundaries. And so we were the only ones to be able to cover all of Europe at a time when it was so necessary to make certain and cover all of Europe. And then talking about barrierless um, thinking, when the wall fell down, a, a, a regulation called COCOM then was no longer in effect. And it meant that American military technology, because a lot of technology in satellites was from the military, could be used in Russia and could be exported to Russia. Now, Russia had the best launching capabilities at that time in, from, from the start of 1967 when they first launched that Sputnik. And so I said, wouldn't this be wonderful to use the Russian launchers now to bring our Astra satellite up into space? I started then, and here again, ladies, people talk about Elon Musk, but quite frankly, Elon Musk took a NASA technology and commercialized it, but I did this 20 years beforehand, and I did it with Russian technology <laughs> and put, put together ILS, International Launch Services, together Khrunichev, and they, they launched the Proton rocket, so you can see that P-R-O-T-O-N, and Lockheed Martin from the United States, and it was a European company, My Astra Satellite, who was the first Occidental satellite to be launched on a Russian satellite. 
and the launcher. And this we and we were we were the number one launcher, ILS, International Launch Services, from um, from the um, uh, from uh, uh, 1995 to 2005. When okay, then SpaceX came and Elon Musk. But you know, hey, okay. Now one thing in in life that is really important to understand is it's one thing to become number one. It's another thing to stay number one. And so in 1988, um, I decided, and, and quite frankly, there were some people, that's a whole other story, we'll talk about that another time, but actually the people who we had helped become uh, um, uh, number one in their different markets for television, Rupert Murdoch, Leo Kirsch, Silvio Berlusconi, you, you know all of these names, they decided that our Astra satellite was so great that they wanted to take it over. Had they taken it over though, they would no longer have been independent. And I'm a big believer in being independent. And so we were, we were able, it was hard and life is hard, but if you know that you're right, you've got to fight and you've got to win. And I won that we would keep Astra independent. And then I said, in order for us to be always independent, we need to become number one, not only in Europe, but in the world. And so I architected SES Global. You see all of these satellites to become in 2001, the world's largest satellite system, and it still is. And, you know, here again, talk about initiative, private initiative. The gentleman on the left, Count Roland de Kergolet, he was a private person and he believed in our vision of creating freedom of choice. And in 1983, when nobody, no governments, there wasn't any venture capital, there was, you know, we, everybody hated us, except for the citizens. And, and, and he said he would invest $1 million. When we went public on the stock market in 1997, 14 years later, it took a little while, he received 1,000 times the return of his investment. But he had the he 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 had the vision and he took the risk so you know i have been so fortunate because i do believe that satellites can do so much so here we have teleport europe it was my second company um it was for b2b business to business communications here again covering all of europe bringing digital um technology to the Eastern European countries who did not even have it, leapfrogging the West because we were using satellite to bring the latest in technology. Very happy. Uh, I, I, I worked to create Iridium. Um, and indeed, uh, I, I worked at this time uh, with two Saudi groups who, um, who had invested and were uh, backers of Iridium. And that was wonderful. Um, started the world's first, not only broadband internet satellite service i actually started the world's first internet service and then made it become the world's first broadband internet satellite service and then of course you know in 2012 um uh you know started uh ownsat oceania women's network satellite and what happened was that you see all of these islands in the pacific well there was young one young lady who was from new zealand at the bottom there and she said, Candace, we need to have internet and we need to have satellite. You do both of these. Can you help us? We're trying to get some capacity from Australia. I said, don't go to Australia. That's ridiculous. Start your own SAT, your own SAT, Oceania Women's Network Satellite. She was the president of the Pacific Internet Society. I'm telling you this so that you'll understand, you know, what you can do. And so sure enough, we went and we got all of the presidents of the internet societies on all of these islands, Tuvalu, um, Vanuatu, Cook Island, Solomon Islands, Samoa. You know what? The Pacific is a matriarchal society. All of the presidents of the internet society, they were all women. So I said, well, this is even better. We'll just do it ourselves. We won't let any men come in. Now, <laughs> I was at a certain point in my life where I could afford to do that, and I did. Why not? It's fun. 
And by the way, today we are now bringing high throughput broadband internet to all of these islands for education, for government, for health care. We're also because of the climate change, unfortunately, many of these islands will disappear. And so we're helping them with the communications as they then transport all of their people to New Zealand or to Australia to start up their own countries again. So, you know, I always say, and here again, this is one thing for you to think about. I always say it starts with satellite, it never ends with satellite. Because indeed, satellite is an enabler. We connect, it's a mirror. And so I was very involved and, and still am with Raspberry Pi. So the, you know, the, the, the small $35, you see the picture here, $35 computer. And I wanted to bring it to, um, to the Middle East. And so I had a friend in Lebanon and she did all of the coding, not the coding, the, the, she did the translation of the program for the Raspberry Pi into Arabic. And we started it in, um, in Lebanon with a, a program called Youth to Youth, where 10 year old kids would teach other 10 year old kids how to code and program with the Raspberry Pi. And you see here the, um, the Lebanese telecoms minister speaking with the Lebanese education minister and showing how this is done. And what happened was that, you know, this is sad, but you have to go beyond things. It turned out that UNICEF, that, you know, they said, whoa, we would like to put your program in the refugee camps for the Syrian children in Lebanon. And so those kids still today are using our program, Youth to Youth. But that wasn't enough. When I went to Kenya, I was, I was introduced to a group called Maasai Mamas. Maasai from Kenya, and the mamas were the women. And they were showing how they beaded and wove and everything. I said, I'm, I don't want women to learn how to bead and weave. I want women how to learn how to code and program and earn money. And so I took our youth to youth program and I did it with mamas to mamas. And so here, with, you know, and, and everybody, I want you to know, it was 5,000 dollars, 5,000 euros, 5,000 euros. And I bought, not only did I buy 50 Raspberry Pis, but I also bought the screens. I bought the, the uninterruptible power supply. That was a big thing. And, and, and we started the, this mama's dream hub. And in there are all of the Raspberry Pis. And the kids go in there during the day, the youth to youth, and the mamas go in there at night and on the weekends to learn how to use the code, the, to, to code and program using Raspberry Pi. So you can do so much if you just have an idea and you say, I want to make it happen, and you work hard to make it happen. And so Dan, I'm drawing to my end now here, the, um, uh, the, the, you know, indeed, we do have um, a number of now, because people have realized that today in our digital society, our digital economy, that, the, the, that all of this can be connected by space. Quite frankly, I'm, I'm a little bit prejudiced, but not that prejudiced. Really, the world is dependent on space. And, and so that of course causes another problem that there are perhaps too many satellites and debris that are not being perfectly channeled. And so as Dr. Amru said, I'm working now in space situational awareness, but also space traffic management to put basically traffic lights into space to say, don't go here, go here, be careful, a collision could be coming, et cetera. And you know, when I was six years old, uh, I was building my own transistor radio. But you know, that was 60 years ago, a little bit more. So you know, uh, then kids started building their own um, uh, uh, um, computers. But today, kids, and I really hope young women, are you know using uh, their their abilities to build their own satellites, their own CubeSats and their own micro rockets because they can and you can. And 
you know, we're also using satellites to, um, to preserve our Earth um, and to do Earth observation, to, um, to you know, detect wildfires, to detect um, um, drought, to help with precision agriculture. And, you know, along the way, dear young ladies, you know, I, I realized how fortunate I was. Uh, and so around, well, 30 years ago, I started the, it'll, our 30th anniversary will be next year. I started the Global Telecom Women's Network, where a group of women around the world, top executives get together and bring along the next generation. Our slogan is the changing culture of communications from generation to generation. And it's also important that women be on boards. So next year, um, will also be our 10th anniversary of the Global Board Ready Women, which I got started. And now to have all of you dream a little bit, uh, indeed, Gwyn Shotwell. So Gwyn is the president of SpaceX. Um, Elon Musk is the chairman, but let me tell you, Gwyn is the one, and I don't mind saying it in public, who's really doing such incredible work at SpaceX. She and I and a couple of friends, my very dear friend, Claudia Kessler, we are trying to put together the first ever female space crew, all female space crew to go to the uh, International Space Station. And so in conclusion, I would just share with you the ABCs of realizing your dreams. And I'll just pick out a couple and I'll be giving this presentation to Amru so that he can share it with everybody. You know, avoid negative sources, people, things, and habits. B, believe in yourself. I always love D, don't give up and don't give in. I love, I love um, uh, G, give more than you plan to give. You always get so much back. Q, quitters never win and winners never quit. V, visualize it. If you can see it, you can do it. And Z, zero in on your target. You will achieve it. So I'm looking forward to the questions now from Dr. Amru, and then afterwards to hopefully receiving uh, your questions as well. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Candice, for this great enlightenment and sharing uh, an inspirational uh, story of yours and journey. Uh, really uh, very exciting to Good. hear and, and listen that from you. Um, I have a few questions or points of discussion on empowerments and innovation. I would start with empowerments. You know, as you may know, uh, the, the empowered Saudi youth, female and male, uh, is our strategic win card. So from your personal experience, how you know, did you earn your empowerment to reach where you are today? And what are the key lessons learned? So, you know, the, that's why I shared that last slide, you know, the ABCs, which, by the way, I keep up, you know, on my blackboard or my clipboard, you know, at my home, and I'm traveling with it all of the time. I was born into a family where we had two boys and two girls. And my mother and father told us all we had to do was to work hard and work well, and we would, we would achieve our dreams. And so we believe that. And, um, you know, the, everybody talks about my father and I think quite rightly so because he, so he, he was General Johnny Johnson. Um, he worked in the White House. He did the first satellites. He was one of the first starters of the OTP, Office of Telecommunications Policy, which became then the Federal Communications Co Com um, Commission, which I know that the, the, the chair of the Space Commission is also um, working on. And, um, you know, but quite frankly, my mother was love personified. And recently, Warren Buffett, you know, so one of the richest people on earth, um, he talked about his mother and the love that she gave to him. And love is very empowering. And so if your mother says, honey, no matter what, I love you, then, <laughs> you know, you do go and you try to make your mother proud of you. And so I, and, and love is also very powerful. Um, you know, now I'm 68, so I can talk about this. You know, when I was 40, I may not have been able to talk about it. But really, 
you know, and, and another thing which, which makes me get up every single morning and keeps me focused and is my North Star is personal responsibility the feeling of personal responsibility that you as a human being on earth have to make the world better. You are put here for a purpose. And no matter how small that improvement is, if you see that you can write it, if you can write the wrong, then you must do this. And the personal responsibility is to yourself. It's to realize your potential. It's to your ecosystem, your stakeholders. It's to the universe uh, and, and, and to our, our entire planet and the sustainability. So this personal responsibility to achieve something to make the world better, I think is the biggest empowerment of all, Dr. Amr. No, thank you, Dr. Candice. Um, so an, another point uh, on being an entrepreneur for decades, uh, uh, yeah. Dr. Candice, uh, were there any challenges you faced and what kept you motivated to overcome them? I mean, you probably already touched on them, but if there's anything you would like to emphasize on. Yes. So. Um, First of all, you know, it, it, I always just looked at the world and I would say, oh, why aren't they doing this? Or they could do this. Um, but instead of just saying that, I would then, if I really felt strongly about it, I would write it down on a piece of paper. And, and, and I would write it on two pieces of paper because you have the vision, which is very important. And then you have the execution and the implementation of that vision. And so you have to, and two pages gives you enough place to write down and to say, okay, this is how I'm going to do it. This is how much it's going to cost. This is what I need to make it happen. This is very important. If you have done that, then I apply my three prong test. My three prong test is mind, heart, and gut. If my mind, my heart, and my gut says I have to do this, then I have to do it. Now, you know, another thing is people always laugh at entrepreneurs. People all, or they certainly did when I was, you know, being a young woman, but I was so out of it. I didn't realize that people were laughing at me. <laughs> and because I had had my mother and my mother had always told me, she said, I don't care what Sally is doing or what John is doing, or, you know, or even what Dr. Amru is doing. I only care what you are doing. Are you achieving your potential? And so I got used to not worrying what other people thought about me, but just to go, if I really had applied that three-prong approach and go and realize the vision. And when, you know, I, when I was doing that first Astra satellite, which was going against governments, against the status quo, against established, you know, huge, huge, Companies, Airbus, Matra, Aerospatiale, um, you know, everybody, I, I, I wasn't worried because I knew that I was doing what was the right thing. And I think another thing that you have to also care about is if you do have an idea and you have created it and you have worked hard, you must make certain that you get, that you, the individual entrepreneur, get the responsibility. Now, many times in my life, Dr. Amru, this never stopped me 
from doing things. But it was a huge challenge once I did the thing to get people to understand that it was me who had done it and not somebody else. And I actually, one time, I had to fight for seven years um, to get my the credit that I had done. I had to take two lawyers, um, one in Europe and one in the United States. I had to enlist the prime minister of Luxembourg and the president of the European Commission who could say, this woman, Candace Johnson, is the one who has done this. It took seven years. When it happened, my father, who had suffered so much to see that all of the work that I had done over all of those years, when it finally, when I got my final recognition and, and, the, and the, the credit, he came specially to Europe. And, you know, it was because I could not live a lie. I could not say, oh, somebody else did this. And, and so you must fight, no matter how hard it is, to right also those wrongs and to make certain that your work is, is recognized and that you get credit for it because that is part of being an entrepreneur. It doesn't always have to be monetary uh, uh, recognition. Um, in, in our word, world today, where the, the, the world needs so much help and environment and climate change, et cetera, it can be immaterial, which increasingly is becoming much more material, but it must be your work must be recognized, your vision, your intellectual property. Well deserved, Dr. Candace, and very empowering words uh, to our youth in the kingdom, and especially women and female for, you know, uh, for getting them motivated to be uh, space uh, frontier or space entrepreneurship in the future and help build the ecosystem of space in the kingdom. Um, you know, there is another point of innovation that I would like to touch on. And, uh, you know, how can the space industry contribute to the digital economy? You know, uh, unless you can build the hardware, you cannot actually deliver data to give you those useful applications, you know. Um, so I, I would say it's probably, or I would say it is important to connect the downstream and the upstream to be able to have an effective solution via space application. I mean, uh, we've seen the data driven from the Copernicus program uh, and uh, and uh, the constellation, satellite constellation in ESA. Could you please elaborate on, on this topic? Sure. So, you know, um, as I said, it starts with satellites, it never ends with satellites. And also, you know, when my dad did the first Satellites for America, um, people would tell him, they'd say, Johnny, you know, what are we going to do with these things? And then he would always throughout the years say, and from that day on, humans have always found new ways of using space for application on Earth. Um, so the, the, and I, you know, in a way, I started with content. I started with soft because I said, okay, I've done these great programs. They were not data programs, they were music programs, but I wanna put them on space. I wanna use space to, um, to uh, spread it throughout the United States. Also, when, you know, one of the kind of things that really helped our Astra satellite was when we started it, people did know about satellites. And so whenever you had a, um, a, um, a presentation on satellites, they would have a, up, a, a, a uplink station, a picture of an uplink station. They would have the satellite in orbit and they would have a picture of a downlink station. That is not the point. What we did with the Astra satellite television we said, 
this is what you're going to get with the Astra satellite. And we had a video wall of 16 different channels about sports, news, movies, fashion, shopping. That's what people were going to get. They weren't going to get a signal that went up and down. No, they were going to get the content. And so I think that this is very, very important. And, you know, today um, I'm the chair of the Seraphim uh, Space Tech Fund, and we just did an IPO um, in, um, on the London Stock Exchange. And also one of our companies um, uh, just did an IPO on the New York Stock Exchange, where I was, uh, where I was ringing the bell with them, and um, called Spire. And they are doing everything having to do with extreme weather prediction. And recently we have put a woman on our board of the Seraphim Space Fund um, named Anne Winblatt. Anne is the software VC of the world. She's amazing. And she's been doing, she's been financing software since 1985. And so when I called her up and I said, hey, Anne, you know, would you be on our international advisory board? She said, Candace, I'm a software person. I said, Anne, that's why I'm calling you. Increasingly, satellites themselves are becoming software defined. So the software on the, on the hardware is enabling the satellite to be much, much more, much more performant. And also, you know, everything. So whether it's also AI, big data, you know, all of this, satellites are helping this, but gathering the data, putting the data back. And even at the moment, we are seeing that we are using quantum computing and AI on the satellites so that we can decrease the bandwidth needed for this transmission and be able to make these satellites even more efficient. So it really is a marriage made in heaven between software and hardware. And, you know, if anybody thinks that it's the contrary, then they're having a big problem. And I would just also say one thing, you know, what we're increasingly we're seeing as well, and this has really brought about the, um, uh, the, the new space economy, even though I have been doing new space for the last 40 years. I've never done a government funded project. I've, you know, I've only done financially, um, privately financed, commercially oriented satellites. But at the end of the day, it's always about the bang for the buck. Whether it was 40 years ago when I was doing Astra and we became in the black after we launched our first satellite because we had taken all of the leases and told the people, if you pay us 10 years up front for your lease, then you know, you'll get a transponder, a channel. They all did. And from day one, we were, but it was smart. It was smart. And today what is happening is that the, the, the components are becoming so miniaturized that the size of the satellites is going to, you can do on a nanosat what you used to do on a huge geo satellite. You can do on a small rocket what you used to need to, you know, have for, you know, to pay 90 million for. You can now pay, you know, basically almost a thousand dollars per kilo. And that's, that's really great. So the bang for the buck. And also, if you look at um, Jeff Bezos, he was, a, he was a, a Wall Street banker before he got into space. If you look at companies like Peter Platzer, he was also a, a Wall Street banker before he went into space. So, you know, trying to marry the components of software, hardware, and microelectronics um, this is really helping us make satellites and democratize satellites for everyone. And I look back to 1999, Hughes, um, you know, said, you know, could I do some blue sky thinking for them? And in 1999, I said, well, you know what? Everybody's going to have their own personal communication satellite, PCS. 
We're not there yet, but we're almost there. Very ambitious, Dr. Candice. Thank you so much. Um, so I would have two more quick points to touch on and then I'll yeah. leave the floor to the audience. You know, so how do you see the private sector could play a major role in space innovation and what are the best strategies to write it to write it perfectly? Okay, so, you know, I mean, first of all, uh, innovation is innovation, you know, whether it's space, whether it's, you know, whatever. Um, I, I will just use one example, and it's a very good example. Um, when we were starting the Astro Satellite, SES, world's largest satellite, we, we did not make a better satellite system. What we did was realize that on the ground, there were what was becoming into a place, gallium arsenide LNBs, low noise block down converters. And the reception equipment that those gallium arsenide LNBs were being able to receive signals that were 10 times weaker than what had normally been the, the, the case. And so it was the application. So when we said, whoa, we could use an off the shelf satellite with 25 watts and get the same performance on ground because we're using a, a, um, a gallium arsenide reception terminal, we can have a competitive edge. And the competitive edge was that um, uh, the, the satellite systems that the European Union were doing at the time were 250 watts instead of 25 watts. And they cost 10 times as much as what we were going to use. So it's, you, you would be surprised. The innovation is never where you think it's going to be. And so you must be very, very open. And I apply what I call object-oriented technology, but in my thinking. So I have that data depots. So you have memory memory pockets in your mind. And then you are open to everything, to all different stimuli. And so you are constantly pulling these stimuli. And then at night, you think, I have a problem, but I need to solve it. And so you train your mind. I know, I know people think I'm a little bit crazy, but this is true. You train your mind during the nighttime to literally connect those dots and to get the solution. And that innovation, which is really seeing and being open to all possibilities going on, then this is when the magic happens. Great, uh, thank you, Dr. Candice. Uh, you know, I, I'd like to touch on a last point of discussion uh, for for us here, and then I'll leave the floor open to the audience for any Q and A. Um, you know, in your opinion, what is the most and and clear strength areas that the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia can build upon to contribute of the growth of space sectors? I mean. Uh, in general, from your previous engagement with the with the kingdom space sector and satellites, uh, what would you uh, you know uh, have as 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 maybe advice or recommendation? Well, you know, first of all, you really do have such a, a wonderful cadre of very smart, very well educated young people, and um, and I think that all of the programs that the kingdom has been doing to really make certain that every person, every person from you know, any economic level, whatever, that they are getting access to being able to go and be trained as an entrepreneur, et cetera. I, 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 think, this is, I think this is really great. You know, I, I, one of my very happy moments was when I met Abdullah Reis, who was the founder of Enwani and, um, in Saudi Arabia. And, um, and, and I helped him and he was just a brilliant young man. And then he got bought, the Enwani got bought by Karim. 
And, you know, Abdullah went on then to become a co-founder of, of Karim. And it is that, you know, it is that innovation and the pro, but you know, what happens is that, that in Wani, it gave addresses to people who didn't have addresses. And so Abdullah had recognized that there was a problem and he then solved it with Enwani. And Karim, of course, needed to know where to go for all of those, you know, for their, their taxi services. So, you know, I think that, um, uh, I think that Saudi Arabia, first of all, you, you know, you are, a, you are a, a world leader. And of course that is also comes with responsibilities. And so if I go back to my personal responsibility, I would really say that, um, you know, I, I, every young Saudi person who sees a problem very much has a responsibility and to solve it if they can. And that nine times out of 10, because we are in this digital world and digital society and digital economy, it will have something to do with space. It will, you know, whether it's robotics, whether it's AI, whether it's big data, whether it's quantum computing, it is all connected also with space. Our habitats that we are creating in space are, now, are allowing us to um, work uh, in the desert. And by the way, I have a young woman entrepreneur. Her name is Barbara Belvisi. She started working with interstellar labs. She created interstellar labs for habitats in space. It turns out that now Saudi Arabia is asking her, she's young, she's 30 years old, to do her interstellar pods, which she had thought for moon, but to do them in the desert. So, you know, you all have great ideas. Um, there's another young Saudi Arabian woman, Michal, who's doing Michal Aerospace. Um, and um, whether it's hardware, you know, it, it's a good idea to maybe get started on building a little CubeSat or a, a little rocket because that forces you to really concentrate. But once you've done that, you will see, oh my gosh, I could use it for this, I could use it for that. And, and you know, and like my dad said, from that day on, everybody has found new uses for space. And I'm quite sure that the ingenuity of the uh, Saudi Arabian youth uh, will continue to lead us in space. Thank you, Dr. Candice. Um, you know, I'm, I'm going to leave it now to the floor and see to the audience to see if they have any questions. Um, yep. I see one question. So, so I, I, have to, I have to tell Fatima. So Fatima, I don't want you to wait for your own satellite. I want you to go out and build it. <laughs> okay, okay. And yes, uh, um, also Fatima, um, uh, most of the technologies, most of the technologies, um, you know, when we look at, when we went to the moon and um, we, the mobile communications was uh, originated in when we went to the moon, um, the Gore-Tex, the, you know, the, the tissue, uh, freeze-dried, everything freeze-dried was, uh, was all of this. And certainly what we are doing um, as we do space research um, is increasingly having um, results that can be applied on Earth. This is no question. And all of my friends who are in space, you know, we always say we have to take care of mothership Earth first. Awesome. I see another interesting question, Dr. Candice, question two. Yeah. Uh, which is about uh, what can you tell someone that is, uh, sorry, from your perspective, what do you think about building the first Saudi rocket as you know, everything at first stage and planning? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, absolutely. Um, uh, I, 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 I definitely think you should do it. Yeah, there is a huge need for um, the, the smaller rockets because um, the, you know, we have so many nanosats um, who used to be doing ride shares, but 
we, we, we don't have enough space on the quote unquote traditional um, uh, rockets. And then you have a, a company like Rocket Lab um, and they're, they're, they're based in the United States and in New Zealand, uh, which is perfect because they're close to the equator, they're close to the water, you know, et cetera. But no, I, I mean, we desperately, it's a good, you know, I look at everything from market, what they call TAM, the addressable market. If you can come up with a good uh, rocket, I mean, at this point, I think, you know, you want to try and use um, perhaps something, you know, you don't perhaps need to um, have it be um, uh, or fuel. You can, I mean, hydrogen is becoming something very good for the propulsion, electric, electric propulsion. So also, you know, maybe having a, another twist on it, um, having it be able to launch small. I think we're looking today now at a, you know, a good rocket um, would be, uh, able to do about 700 kilos at least so that it can take care of the smaller and slightly larger satellites like Iridium. Um, so yeah, definitely. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Candice. Uh, I guess I, I see an answer also from Fatima, you know. She, oh, oh. She's... <laughs> yes. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Excellent, Fatima. Wonderful, wonderful. And also, uh, Ali, great that you're going to build that first rocket. That is wonderful. And please, you know, I am the type of person, and, and Dr. Amru knows this, and I will make this um, uh, offer to all of you. Um, I do Saturday morning sessions. So every Saturday, I uh, have three sessions, three mentoring sessions, 9, 10, and 11 France time. So just one, one or sometimes two hours, depending on the, the time of year. Um, and these are totally free. Uh, there is a long waiting line. But, um, you know, I, I, try to, um, I try to help you realize your visions. And if you write to Dr. Amru and you tell him what you are really working on and that you would like to have a, a session with me, uh, I would do my best. I, what I do is I, 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 I really only work with people who do have a plan, who are working on really, really, really making whatever their vision is happen. Um, I usually ask for a business plan um, for, you know, a, a market study that you have done, not that you have bought, you, what, but why you think the market is important. Um, so I ask for all of this information beforehand. I then have a one hour session. I'm there just for you. And then I ask that the entrepreneur write the minutes of that meeting. They send them to me. I look at them, I make certain, I say, okay, did we get this right? Did we get this wrong? What are the action points, et cetera? And um, I'm very proud that a number of my mentorees um, have gone on to, um, to really great heights <laughs> in all senses. <laughs> no, yeah, I mean, I, I personally had a good experience with you, Dr. Candice, and the, during the Global uh, Space Industrial accelerator program and you right you just ask for those uh, things the business plan the uh, you have to have a plan and probably a, feas a good feasibility study and a good goal so no uh, that would be a really uh, i mean it's a generous offer from you dr candace and and i thank you um, uh, on behalf of all the audience and saudi space commission for this offer and we will see how we can uh, you know uh, cultivate this uh, and make something out of it together Good, awesome. good. Well, that would be great. And you know, I always tell everybody I learn so much more than you know. People think, "Oh, Candace, why are you doing this?" And I go, "Because I learn so much." <laughs> so. <laughs> it's mutual, I guess. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, yeah. No, thank you, Dr. Candace. I mean, I think we are almost uh, we're running out of time for this session. Um, so uh, quickly, I would just like to thank you so much for this inspirational. Uh, journey, sharing your story, and giving us some good motivational um, advices, and 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 it's just a pleasure, really. Thank you, Dr. Candice, and and if there is anything you would like to say at the last minute, please feel free. 
Well, just that I'm looking forward to coming back to Saudi Arabia. I, I love it. And I actually have, I had helped uh, the kingdom uh, um, work on some things in Taif uh, with, of all things, I went thinking I was going to do high tech and it is high tech, but with the roses of Taif. Oh, and yes. so I actually have four uh, rose bushes I think I'm the only one in the world outside of the French agriculture and the Saudi agriculture. Uh, I have four Taif rose bushes in my garden. So I'm looking forward to coming back to Saudi soon and seeing all of you wonderful young um, entrepreneurs. Thank you, Dr. Candice. Likewise, we're also looking forward to hopefully hosting you soon in the kingdom. And with that, uh, we would like to, I guess, conclude our session for today. Thanks for your time and thanks for the attendance um, uh, and for their good questions uh, and, and, you know, for the time uh, allocated. And thanks for accommodating our time zone difference, Dr. Candice. I appreciate no it. No problem. No problem, Dr. Amru. It's been such a pleasure. And thank you for reaching out and inviting me. Thank you so much. We'll be in touch soon. Okay. Take care. Bye-bye.